applications for you today. And then this afternoon, we're going to have our board meeting to which all members are invited, especially if you're interested in um, serving on the board in the coming years. So, our first presentation this morning is Jennifer Brannick and Elizabeth Laveau from USM. They're going to be presenting digital collection cliff notes, repackaging research in a virtual environment. So, y'all take it away. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, today, Elizabeth and I are going to talk about a project that we um, started that came out of kind of emerged from uh, COVID and the and the changes to instruction and the changes to access um, um, for students for students. Um, so next. And here's us. Here we are. Here's us. Here we are. Um, and we'll have this information later. So Elizabeth, Elizabeth and I both work at USM. Um, and, um, you know, I'm kind of the, so I work in special collections with, you know, instruction and rare books and uh, Mississippi books and things like that. I'm the book person and the instruction reference. Elizabeth is the go to about anything. <laughs> And she just knows it all. If you have any questions about anything technical or digital, she, she does it. But she uh, does a fantastic uh, job running the uh, digital lab where they digitize materials, put them online. Um, of course, she works with digital human humanities and stuff like that. She's, she does a little bit of everything. But um, so together, we decided to create this partnership. Now, this is Dudley. And if you go back a little bit. So, um, like everybody, when we all went home to, um, you know, for COVID and working from home, I, I just didn't know what to do. <laughs> you know, trying to figure out things that I could only do at home, that I could only, um, you know, having to rearrange what kind of stuff I could do. It was just really, you know, kind of um, overwhelming in many ways. Um, and then, of course, you know, it's fun being surrounded by, by the cats, all the animals and, and the dog. But um, so here's Dudley. Um, every morning I would sit down to work, and every morning he would put his, you know, his overfed butt on my on my computer to try to to um, to, to stop me from doing it. Um, and since I, you know, threw Dudley up in the mix, if you go to the next slide, I told all the other animals that I would give them a little piece too. So here's the whole Davies Brannick crew um, who did everything they could during COVID to keep us occupied and. Um, um, <laughs> I do know the audience and who, um, you know, did everything possible to, to make us not work. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Now, 1 thing I'm going to, so we're going to talk about the digital research, um, topics that came out of this. And what I'm doing is in the chat, I'm putting the link to the uh, webpage, um, which we're not going to show live, but I will show screenshots. But in case you want to go back to it later and look at it, you can, you can do that or while, while we're speaking. So this is a picture of um, our instruction room. And like many of y'all, you know, we try to do active learning exercises, um, you know, get the students in there working with the materials, help them, you know, with projects and kind of learning how to use primary sources, what kind of primary sources are out there and just what, um, uh, you know, what's available. So um, with COVID, and I don't know about y'all, but our, in special collections, our instruction basically went zero. I, mean, I may have had one that was online, but I think professors were just trying to figure out what to do and, you know, students were, everybody was stressed. And so um, I think that library instruction, at least for special collection stuff, um, was, did take a hit. So um, if you go to the next slide, um, so, you know, I'm trying to, so I was trying to think of a way to replicate what, um, what the instruction, the kind of benefits that instruction provides students, as well as what, um, um, you know, just so the students could get access to this kind of information without, <laughs> without me actually talking to them or them coming into the into special collections. So, you know, being able to get their hands and to sift through materials um, that are available online. Um, and if you go to the next slide, and, you know, even, um, you know, kind of the show and tells, you know, the one, one stop. Now, you know, show and tell instruction gets kind of a bad rap, but I think it's, I think it's very, very valuable <laughs> considering what, you know, determining what classes you are. I mean, this is a basic English 102 class that's just trying to learn about primary sources and things like that. And I think the show and tell works well. And sometimes I'm even asked by 
you know, Bass by professors to do, you know, show and tell for history classes like History 300, which are our majors, and it's when they first write their big paper, um, just to provide them with an overview and a look of what primary sources are and um, the kind of formats that are there. And I think that's, you know, we could show the different topics because so often, you know, these history students come in and, and they don't know what they're going to write about. They really, they know what primary sources are, but they really don't know how to incorporate it into their writing oftentimes. So um, when I do library instruction, I might, if I'm doing civil rights, I might have, you know, uh, here's a photograph, here's a diary, here's a oral history, here's some, you know, corporate kind of documentation, things like, and maybe some segregation stuff to give them an overall picture of the kinds of materials and the different formats that can be incorporated into, you know, their papers and kind of how, how that works. And so by telling those stories and linking these items together, then I think that it really helps them kind of understand this is how it works. Because I think most of them are used to doing, you know, just writing based on secondary sources, but being able to, you know, analyze and read these, you know, these documents. And of course, that's where things like speed dating or different active learning exercises really give them another, you know, that uh, kind of learning how to read the document. So um, then, so that's where digital collections came up, or the digital research topics. So I was like, how can we, <laughs> and poor Elizabeth, you know, I get these, I sit back and I was like, how can we do this? And I'm always like, Elizabeth, <laughs> how can we make this happen? So I was trying to think of a way to be able to do these little discrete packets um, of digital images by topic that would, that could uh, help provide these students an introduction to um, not only to primary sources, to the different formats that are available in primary sources, but also kind of by topic so that you can see that when you're looking at, um, you know, civil rights and, and voting that you may want to, you know, these are the kinds of documents you could look at. Um, and so, you know, working with Elizabeth, I said, this is kind of what I want to do. And, you know, starting off, a lot of the images we use were already in our digital collections. So it didn't require um, a ton of, um, um, you know, a ton of digitization. Now there were, <laughs> there were some that had, things that had to be digitized, but, um, you know, so there was a way to do it that kind of, you know, made it not as overwhelming. Um, and then fortunately with Elizabeth and them, they were happy to help us with the, um, with the webpage. And I think that's what really adds a lot to it. Um, so let's go to the next one. So, um, so this is one about the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and just lesson learned here. So when I first created this one, it was just Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. But then I started thinking about it. And I was like, you know, <laughs> maybe a lot of these students coming in may not know what that is. So anything that was civil rights related, I put civil rights and Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, civil rights and, you know, voting or something like that to kind of give students, because again, this is intended for students, give them the little, um, you know, heads up that this is what, what, what it's about. Um, and so with each of these, we did a variety of topics and uh, had people in uh, special collections that um, volunteered to help so that we all chose different topics. We tried to cho choose things that students have been researching. Um, so for when I first started at USM 18 years ago, <laughs> I was 18 in years last week. I was like, oh, sweet Jesus. But 18 years ago, when I started working here, civil rights are what so many people researched. And it was a very, the students were interested, faculty were interested. Um, and then after a hand, you know, three, four, five years, it dwindled. And students didn't want to hear about, you know, civil rights. So it was just, um, you know, just a change, I guess, in research interests. Um, also, side note, we have a theory here that if a new documentary comes out on like Netflix, as the week after we have students come in that want to do a research project about that. So always, <laughs> so always go to your streaming services, see what new documentaries are coming out, because I guarantee you the next week students are going to come in and say, this is what I want to write my, my term paper on. Um, so this is going to be the Civil Rights and Mississippi Freedom uh, Democratic Party. So if we go to the next one. 
And so each of the, as we saw before, um, each of the, the, um, the topics has an individual little synopsis that provides um, a little bit about the, the, the topic as well as the link. Now, what we do from there is it links to all these digital items. So, um, you know, and you can see just from this, it, we have uh, uh, campaign posters, um, uh, COFO uh, documents, uh, brochures, you know, diaries, just a whole different thing. Um, you know, even down in the bottom, you know, segregation of the white race must be preserved. So by throwing in a little bit of that segregation stuff, um, it gives them a, a sense of what people are really fighting for. Um, because I think that um, sometimes the students don't fully understand what life was like, especially just for your, you know, your normal person, your normal African-American person in Mississippi. So, um, um, so that's just a way to, to provide all these different, um, uh, different kinds of documents. I'm looking over at the chat. We use uh, Preservica for our um, digital collections and for our um, digital preservation system. Is that right, Elizabeth? I think so. So um, that's what we, that's what we um, had transitioned to some years, some years back. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of the images and this is all from our system Preservica and, um, and how um, the metadata shows at the top of the page with the image there, you can see at the top right corner, there is a download button so the students or any researcher can download the images as well. Um, and if you go to the next slide, uh, you know, again, this is a, uh, a document from the Council of Federated Organizations uh, about uh, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and the, the summer project of 64 um, um, together. If we go to the next one, Okay, and here comes one of the segregation stuff. Um, and I do pair this when I talk to people about civil rights, because I really, because I think that so often we're, we're told, and rightfully so, a lot of the, uh, the um, activists and what they fought for and what they, you know, their act actions and how, what an impact it made. Um, but at least when I moved to Mississippi, I was familiar with the big overview history of Mississippi civil rights, but I didn't know that what individual people were dealing with, you know, what the, the woman who lived down the street was was working with. And that, so that's why a lot of times I throw in these, um, just, you know, occasional se segregation stuff, just to kind of put it all into, into context. And so next slide, Nazis in World War II. <laughs> now that's a heck of a transition there, but I don't know about y'all, but you know, I think it's a documentary thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it back on my documentary theory is that there are a lot of documentaries in World War II and Hitler <laughs> and the concentration camps and all these uh, atrocities. So um, we have students every semester, that's what they wanna do. And, and the history professors tell me that, um, you know, they get kind of tired. There's only so many different ways you can, you can hit this from a history 300 level. Um, and I think my headphones are dying on me. So let me check, cause this is what happens during presentations. One second. I always make the joke that if we're, when we're talking about rare books, technology works perfectly. Anytime we're talking about something technology, that's when it will fail. Without always. doubt. <laughs> always. Can you hear me okay? Great. So, um, so, so this is why, yeah, you know, we did one on um, different materials relating to World War II and especially Nazi, um, the Nazi occupation. Um, so next, next slide. And again, this is a list of different things. Um, we're for, we have uh, a lot of political papers. So of course you're going to find a lot of stuff that, um, um, you know, that, that relates to, because we have a lot of those, you know, kind of mid-century papers. Uh, a lot of materials related to that. We also have some um, one guy who was a member of like a special force who um, was tasked, a, you know, he's a U.S. I think Army, but he would his unit would go in and deal with problem situations that may be, you know, 
you know, kind of removing a general who's kind of gone a little haywire or um, liberating concentration camps. And so in his collection, we have, um, they liberated the, um, the mental hospital in Hadamar, Germany. And so you ha we have all the photos of how they found Hadamar. And, you know, they were still, it was an extermination site, so it was still pretty, pretty gnarly, but um, the students love that. So we pull, we put in images from that collection, a lot of stuff about Theodore Bilbo and, um, and what was going on during World War II. Um, yeah, the WASP, the Women's Air Force Service pilots, you know, we have a collection or two about that as well that, um, that we, could, we could add, add to these. Um, so if you go to the next slide. This is something Theodore Bilbo did, and I, just, I wanted to give a little more of it because the metadata, you know, takes a little bit of the image away. But this was a, so Theodore Bilbo was a, a U.S. Senator um, from Mississippi, and he was quite, you know, um, he was just a, kind of a bad dude. <laughs> but six months after Hitler was dead, he put out this bill to offer a reward for $1 million for the apprehension of Hitler because he thought Hitler was still alive. So, um, you know, I always tell students, I said, here's like kind of where conspiracy theory can kind of come in, even at the government level. Um, of course, it, I don't think it ever made it out of committee. But um, he did, it was in the newspaper, so it was in the Pascagoula, or Picayune, I think he's from Pascagoula newspaper. And he was receiving letters, and we have these from people saying, if you give me $1 million, I will gather an army together and find Hitler. Like, oh, it's got movies with all like Hitler. And uh, it's really, you know, kind of a, an interesting look at this. And so if you go to the next slide. So this is a picture from Hadamar, Germany, um, where um, um, it was a, a, a hospital that had people who had mental illnesses. Also, it housed, um, at the time, you know, people who were gay, um, people who for activists and um, things like that. And it was, they did have a, um, an oven there. So it was really just a bad situation. And when the unit came in, and I always tell the students, talk to students about this, you know, because so often you see, you don't have it where people are coming to pictures of them actually entering the site and trying to, you know, stop operations. But that um, they, You know, they were still like trying to get rid of. You know, they were murdering people as they were entering, <laughs> and so it was just a, a horrible thing. Um, but you know, this is very popular with the students. They like to um, kind of look into to these types of things. So it's an interesting case too, because it's a hospital. And you know, what about the Hippocratic Oath and things like this to save people? And then the nurses and stuff were doing a lot of the murders. So, so let's go to the next one. poem about Hitler. So we threw that in there. Of course, this is an anti-Hitler thing, a uh, poem, and, um, you know, and again, it just shows the different, you know, I don't expect the students to be able to write a paper from these documents, and if they are, it must be one heck of a paper, but it's just a way to, again, show different kinds of materials all on topic so that they can get a sense that these are the kinds of things I can look for. This is what's possible, um, and this is what, um, what I, what I can do. And I always try to impress upon them that you can use creative works, you can use novels, you can use, you know, poems, you can use, you know, religious sermons, things like that to kind of build your case. It doesn't have to be something just like a letter from a governor to so-and-so or, you know, stuff like that. It can be more informal and more um, uh, just, you know, not as official, <laughs> I suppose. So next slide. And we also um, have, you know, you know, as you know, yesterday there was a talk about trying to reach, um, you know, underrepresented um, people in the archives, you know, groups in the archives. And of course, like um, we're trying to build our LGBTQ uh, collection, and um, and I know that there's a lot of interest in um, in that topic, so I wanted to make sure to get this out there. Um, if you go to the next slide. We don't have very many items, but um, but it's been it's been 
pretty well used. Um, we have a just this semester, or it was last semester, there was a media history class. And a woman there in the class got her paper accepted at a national conference on uh, Lesbian Front, which was a Mississippi publication I'll talk about shortly, about the Lesbian Front and, um, you know, the gays and lesbians in Mississippi during, you know, pre-1980. Um, and the one thing they remarked, <laughs> she got accepted, but one of the things they remarked was that um, the resources were really rocking. <laughs> Yeah, and so she wrote me a long email telling me about this and how appreciative she was. Um, but let's go to the next slide. And so Lesbian Front, I don't know if y'all heard of this or not. Um, I just came across it, you know, every Tuesday on one of my listservs. There is, that's like a rare book dealer day. <laughs> so, you know, I go through, I spend, you know, half the day going through what people are selling to see um, what's available. And so one particular woman had six or seven issues of Lesbian Front, which was a lesbian publication put out in the 70s um, out of Jackson, Mississippi. Um, they claimed, I think rightfully so, that it may have been the first lesbian publication in the state of Mississippi. And, um, you know, it was their way of trying to create community um, in, in the state. And, you know, you can even see here, you know, it's funny, they say this is the last issue but I think they had a change of heart because four more issues came out. <laughs> they came after it. But um, you know, the whole point, and you know, as you see here, is it created chain of communication among Mississippi lesbians. They also provided book reviews and poems and things of different uh, organizations um, uh, nationally that that people can reach out to. And if you go to the next slide, one thing too about. Um, about this in front is that, um, you know, it was all mimeographed, you know, kind of zine format. And students nowadays, when I say zine, I don't really see awareness. <laughs> you know, because it's, it's something from my generation, you go to the Kinkos and you do your, you know, you do your thing. So, um, you know, to bring this out that this is something that someone just pasted together and went to a copier and, you know, um, and created it. Um, the this right here, for instance, is a just to show what they would do. So this is from the Advocate from October eighth, and they would summarize kind of what's happening in issues. And you know, I don't know um, if um, um, you know how it was with the man, because you know there are there have been periods of time, you know, whether it's in the you know sixties and even going into the seventies, where you know it was difficult to send. <laughs> so the thing, I don't know how that was, how that was for kind of um, uh, publications like this. Um, now, one thing about this that I did not include is that the publication was actually sent to a lesbian, I think Lesbian Voice, which was a uh, publication based out of California. So this one wasn't sent to someone in Mississippi, um, oddly enough. And um, but it's just a great resource that students really identify with, and it gives them that primary, you know. From our source. Okay, next slide. And this is another document, uh, the National Gay Task Force that that we that we highlight um, on there as well, that talks about um, you know a different a media alert that came out about uh, a um, pretty much an anti <laughs> you know that depicted rape in a very you know horrendous way, and they were gathering together to. To go against that. So next slide. So those are just a handful of the different ones uh, that we have created. We're still creating more, and Elizabeth's going to follow me on this. So, um, but one thing um, that I want to emphasize is that, and I did send the link, and I'll send the link out again in case new people who joined recently did, don't get access to the link. Um, but the um, collaboration. <laughs> now, Liz and I were talking before before this. She goes, you know, we were talking about should we drive off the cliff? For, you know, is that how far we're going to take this collaboration on this project? But um, you know, it's just this is something I couldn't do on my own. You know, and it really helps to have the digital um, lab crew here and Elizabeth especially to kind of kind of get this going and envision it in a way that I couldn't because I'm not going to go in there and be like I want this laid out like this. You know, I mean, I just like what can we do, you know, and, you know, she's very great about trying to figure out a way to, um, to, to visualize that. 
So, you know, Elizabeth's going to talk a little more about um, her side of the of the project. And honestly, I'm not sure who is uh, driving that car there. If Jennifer's driving us off a cliff, or if I am, but that's the direction we're going. Man. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about our digital research topics from the perspective of digital collections. So how we took Jennifer's brilliant idea and um, kind of help it come to life a little bit and the systems and techniques that we use to make that happen, if that's something that you want to, to replicate. Um, previously, somebody asked in the chat, you know, what system we were using to make this possible. And we use a variety of systems that are actually stacked together. Of course, this right here is Digital Collections homepage, which is a Squarespace site. And we've got our navigation link up uh, for the research topics up at the top. But that's just kind of the top layer of it, of that website. And the provider itself, the fact that it's Squarespace, doesn't actually matter. Right, this could be done with any website of any kind. Um, but that's just the, the top layer. We've got our discovery layer underneath that. And so we're using um, Primo VE, but again, any discovery service could also replicate this. And we use that to course parse through the metadata, which we'll talk about here in just a second, to bring all of these items together because they're not necessarily related in a way that metadata would naturally bring them together. Um, so we had to, to manufacture that, that custom search for it. Uh, and then of course the, the system at the bottom that holds all of these items are, is our content management system. And in our case, that is Preservica. Uh, so we tried very hard to make our interfaces as seamless as possible. Uh, I mean, of course, you are your own worst critic, so I look at them and I can say how, how they're not exactly matching. <laughs> but hopefully, as you go through the site, um, you know, the goal is that you actually don't know what system you're on. We're hoping that it's that seamlessly uh, designed and connected together, because however many tools and, and products that are used to make this happen, right? The end user doesn't care about any of that. They just want to get to the items as seamlessly as possible. So they don't really necessarily need to, to know that they're jumping back and forth between different systems. Um, that's really just more for us on the back end, but it does take several things to kind of make this happen. But as I mentioned with the discovery layer, we use that layer to parse through all of our metadata to make these items come together in their, um, I guess, artificial collections, because the items on on the various topics come from different collections. Uh, there are different format types, right? As Jennifer showed, that they're, they're not necessarily items that you would um, expect to see all in one collection together. So, in our metadata schema, we have a field for this type of of work called custom searches, which of course is, is not, it's a local field, uh, not part of any schema other than USMs or if it's replicated in um, like the Mississippi Digital Library schema, uh, of course it's present there, things like that. So we came up with a way to standardize the different slugs, the different terms, um, so that we could tag each item necessary to put it in that collection. So this is an example from our ABC, the Dugarman Books and Primers collection uh, research topic. I said collection, research topic <laughs> uh, from the Dugarman collection. Uh, but in our custom searches field, we have this topic underscore ABC books. And so that is kind of the little slug that we've used to designate this item is going to be part of this research topic. Uh, because otherwise, based off the metadata, there'd be nothing to pull these items together. And we tried to make this as future proof as possible so that it could scale and grow over time. So this, of course, is just the, the links, um, the topics that we started with. And as Jennifer mentioned, you know, we hope to, to add to it. Uh, because these are like little bite sized chunks of it, we're not necessarily, you know, the goal is not to grow a particular topic, huge thousands and thousands of items that kind of takes away the access accessible nature of it for 
kind of a, a beginning student there. So just the, the handful of items, but certainly increasing the amount of topics that uh, people could browse through kind of in this format. So for everything we have topic so that we know it's a digital research topic and our underscore and then whatever our, our slug, our shorthand is for that particular collection. And then that's what we put into our custom search term field to bring these together. So when we first conceived of this item uh, or this idea and put it online, this was our initial layout. And of course, if you visited the site today or you'll see in later screenshots, it does not look like this now. Uh, this was kind of one of our early lessons that we learned of having the three columns for research topics for people to be able to, to kind of browse through did not allow us to scale very easily. If we wanted to add a new collection uh, in between, say, anti-communism and chat books, if we wanted to put something that started with a B in there, it was going to require us to adjust not only that row, but every other row below that, right? If we just wanted it to be three rows and three across, we were going to have to manually uh, move different research topics anytime we wanted to add a new one. Um, and that's not really the most efficient way uh, going about it. <laughs> and for those who are keeping track at home, right now you're actually looking at a Squarespace site. Uh, just kind of note what system we're on as we go through, and then you can tell me how seamless or not it <laughs> happens to be. Um, but yeah, so we, as much as we liked the look of this layout, we very quickly determined that it was not going to help us in the long term. So we moved to a one column layout here. So that way, anytime we wanted to insert a new topic, uh, we didn't have to rearrange all of our rows and, and move things um, all around. We could just insert wherever it is in alphabetical order. Because of course, working in the library, we're a little OCD and it needs to be in alphabetical order or we go a little crazy <laughs> um, with that. So again, you're looking at, at Squarespace at this point. But if we were to pick a, a research topic and click on the view materials button, it's going to take us over to a Preservica view um, of all of the different items listed out. So of course Jennifer sh shown a different collection of this but similar um, screenshot here. So we've gone from Squarespace over to Preservica, hopefully seamlessly and you, you see your list of items there. And you pick any particular item, and of course you'll get the full size of that item, your metadata, and your, your options to download or print or do whatever. You'll notice in the metadata, even if I was to, to show more and expand and show quote unquote all of the metadata, you're still not gonna see that custom search term. So that's a hidden field that only serves um, the functionality described. It, again, means nothing to the end user. So we've stripped that out so that we're not cluttering up the interface. We've worked very hard to keep it as, as streamlined as humanly possible to be neat and clean um, and not distracting. So the focus is on the materials themselves and not on anything else that potentially could be around. So when we looked at our traffic and we're gonna get into our statistics here, um, just a bit of it, we very quickly realized that almost a quarter of our traffic was coming from mobile. It was coming either from cell phones or from tablets. It was coming from something other than a desktop, right? And back in 2011, we can see that it was estimated 95% of students were bringing their phones to class every day. Given that this is 10 years later, um, I would argue that's probably like 99.999 repeating percent of students uh, bring their cell phones to class. So it was very important to make sure that our interface was going to adapt to a mobile device to make sure that it was responsive, that it would scale to whatever your screen size was going to be, and that it was going to be just as easy to navigate on a very small screen as it would be on your desktop. Um, like I'm very spoiled. I have a split screen set up in my office so I can make these things as large as I want. But, you know, when students are working, sitting in class and, and trying to pull up some example of an item, they're 
you know, got their itty bitty screen under the table. They're trying to hide it from everybody. Um, so <laughs> we're going to try to support that and meet the students where they are. If that's the device that they want to use to view it, then we need to make sure that our, our layout and our presentation of those materials supports that. So we paid uh, quite a bit of attention to how this is going to look uh, from a mobile device. So you can see what our, our home page looks like, um, where it scales down. It turns all of our navigation simply into that hamburger um, button up at the top right. When you expand that out, then you get our full um, navigation options, including research topics that you see down there, uh, as well as all of our um, main collections for that. So each one of our different areas, of course, is made up of multiple physical collections, right? We have multiple physical collections to a digital collection. Um, but starting from those collections, just highlighting those particular areas. And then, of course, individuals can scale down from there or they can search and go to the items directly. When we're starting to look at the digital research topics in this, you can see that we've we've made them uh, again, full screen, so they can get just that little bit of description of it and view materials and making sure that the button for view materials is as obvious as possible uh, so that they can get to all of their, um, all of the different things. So when we're, we're looking at all of the ways that students can access these materials, both from a physical standpoint, and then of course COVID made us, forced us to look almost exclusively from a virtual standpoint. But in order to see these items, there's a variety of ways that students could get to them, right? As Jennifer showed in the beginning, all of the wonderful um, instruction classes that she does, bringing students in, right? The primary access point for all of these materials, of course, is digital collections uh, or digital collections. What the? Jennifer, feel free to slap me later. 100% valid is special collections. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's too early. We need a little more caffeine. So, of course, the primary access point for all of these materials is special collections. And hopefully we want students to come into the archives uh, to view those materials, right? So the whole point of digital collections is to give kind of a taste of what's in special collections and drive people to come to the archives. Even if we were to digitize everything that's in the building, which, let's be honest, is an impossible task, but even if we somehow manage to do that, tomorrow they're going to get another accession of materials and we'll have more to digitize. While that's great job security for me, that means that there's always going to be more in the archives than is ever going to be online. So directing students to the physical space is always going to be an important part of this process. Um, and while that had to be somewhat limited due to COVID, um, it doesn't go away, right? You always need to inform students that there's more in the archives than what they're seeing. And of course, when we're talking about the research topics with you know, an intentionally small group of items, it's imperative that they know there's more um, in the physical archives themselves. But when we're looking from a virtual standpoint, there's still multiple ways that students can access these materials. They can access it from the Special Collections homepage. They can access them from archive space, from the various uh, finding aids. Most finding aids have a link to um, the digitized items from those collections, so that students can access materials through that. Of course, from the library's main website, as well as see more info, which is our discovery uh, interface, particularly for USM. But then we have the digital collections interface, which we've I've shown you uh, today. And of course, everything that's in USM's digital collections gets harvested to the Mississippi Digital Library, as well as things like the Civil Rights Digital Library and other collaborative projects, depending on the topic, right? Obviously not, not everything in the, in the research topics are part of the civil rights, but you, you get the idea. Um, so with all of those different ways to access the materials, you got to ask, do we really need another access point? Is it really worth going through the effort of tagging each individual item and doing all of this for another access point for these research topics? And absolutely, resoundingly, yes. 
we can see in our statistics that the return on our investment of time has been uh, very beneficial to us for a particularly minimal amount of effort designing a web page uh, and tagging these items. Our usage of these items has, has kind of skyrocketed. Since August 2020, which is when these were originally um, launched, and we've, of course, added some research topics since that point, but the research topic page has become our number one viewed page uh, sans the, the home page, which is our, our collections page there is, is actually the um, digital collections home page. So the research topics has surpassed all of our other main department areas from historical manuscripts to Grumman University Archives, oral histories. Research topics has has far out seeded those, as you can tell. And I included the time on the page here in our statistics. So you can see they're not just like our home page, our collections page. Students spend approximately a minute on this page, right? They find what they want in the navigation. They probably look through uh, our home page has a, a scrolling image carousel. So they, you know, hang around, see those pretty pictures and then pick what they actually want to see. Uh, when it comes to the actual collections pages, you can see that students tend to spend three minutes um, between two, two and a half, three minutes on any particular collection site. Uh, oral histories, we always tend to see that uh, that number be a little larger because there's more to read and listen to on an oral history page simply because of the nature of the materials. So we always tend to see that number be um, a little larger. But you can see the research topics, two and a half, right there in the middle between our, our two to three minute. They, they're staying. They're not just like hitting it and bouncing off. Um, and when they do bounce off, when they do have that, that exit number, they're going further into the collections and not actually outside of it. So we can see uh, the tr from the traffic, from the analytics, we can see that they're going from the research topic page in further into a Preservica page into an item, right? So we can track that, that movement through, uh, which is fantastic. So there, we're just guiding them further in um, into the collections there. So we can see with our, our traffic kind of graphed out, we get this on an annual basis, and we, we come to expect this with our digital collections. We get this kind of M shape to our statistics. And you can see that with a, a approximate two and a half years here that is, uh, that's displayed. The starting point is actually the middle of an M uh, if you if you want to get technical about it, because we're starting here in August, so we see a peak around midterms, and we see a little dip after finals uh, until the semester starts again. And again, we get a, a peak around midterms. Notice our peak is a little higher than last time, uh, and dip down for the summer. We start again. We get even higher still. So our return on the amount of effort that has been put into this has been phenomenal. You can see our total growth here is over 141% year over year. Um, so it's it's definitely been a worthwhile investment for us to, to do this. For something that cost us other than time, and I do recognize that time costs, but other than that, zero, we're using the existing infrastructure of our systems. We're using obviously existing items. No items were purchased, to my knowledge, explicitly for this project. So yes, we digitized a few, but we capitalized on the ones that had already been digitized. So it was really as minimal effort as you can get in terms of a digital project, right? And so to have this, um, this type of reception and usage is, is phenomenal. Um, and again, when we track our research topics compared to our other main collection areas, um, you know, we always, again, see oral history kind of be a little higher just by the, the nature of that. And our research topics are e exceeding even that uh, far and away. So we've got oral history for unique views on these. There's a little over 14,000 compared to research topics, which is almost 40,000. <laughs> um, so not, not even in the same ballpark here. 
uh, and this is going from um, our, our form and button conversions. So what you're seeing these views here are when a student is on a collection page and they're clicking that view materials button, you know, the one that I, I pointed out earlier on, um, clicking on that to go further into the collections. Students are clicking on those view material buttons from research topics far more than they do from our individual um, area departments, right? So very high engagement. We haven't really noticed a, a difference in geography, like these are being mostly accessed from English speaking countries, which is uh, as the majority of our materials are uh, in English, that's really no, not surprising. Uh, but we can still see when we look at our research topics, that it's following the same pattern of most of them are in the United States, but it's still getting a pretty good amount of views from the past year uh, outside of, of the country. And we're only in April, right? End of April. So uh, yeah, I'm not mad at those statistics in the slightest. <laughs> so we wanna thank you very much for, for listening to us today. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, we're, we're happy to answer. Uh, okay, so I see a question in here from Greg. Really like the new look of your digital collections. Thank you very much. Um, one question and request, when did USM move public display of digital collections from Digital Commons to Preservica? Uh, it is, it has always, I say always, um, digital collections has never been in B Press. Our institutional repository, Aquila, is in B Press and still is. Uh, there's no intention of moving uh, Aquila out of Digital Commons, um, though there is everything that is in Aquila is also in Preservica, but not in Digital Collections. It's in the back end of Preservica for preservation sake, not for um, access. The only thing that's accessed through Preservica is the Special Collections Digital Collections materials. Yeah, and we used Content DM before Preservica was our previous content management system. Yes, and we transitioned out of Content DM in 2016. So it's it's been a been a hot minute, though it feels like it was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to take a look at that, Greg, for. Um, digital collections page and digital commons, but it's empty. I'll, I'll take a look at that and see. I'm not quite, quite sure what that would be. Um, how the research collections are connected to the catalog. Yes, so they're pulled into that discovery layer into Primo VE, which makes them discoverable through all of our um, what you would be, consider our catalog. So let's see, I think I have an image that might be helpful in this case. Can you see that image? Is that displaying? Awesome. So this is kind of the architecture of USMs. So similar to what you were seeing with digital collections, we have the library's website at the top. Um, lib.usm.edu, and underneath that is Primo VE, and then that's the discovery layer, which searches every system that we have. So Alma is, Ex Libris Alma is what would traditionally be considered to be our catalog, um, but it is alongside the materials from Preservica, from B Press Digital Commons, which is our IR, from Archive Space, so all the finding aids and all of our databases and ebooks and um, all of our electronic resources. So regardless of what in system the material lives in, it's all accessed, discoverable through through Primo. And you kind of see if you look at our library's catalog, um, the Seymour Info, and then you look at our digital collection search, they're very similar. And so they were able to use that search page almost to just you know tweak it for the different things. So you can see how Primo VE is used in those instances. 
Now, Adam, I see your question about copyright. Um, we do uh, look into copyright as we're collecting items. Um, you know, we have our children's literature collection here. We would not <laughs> just throw up a lot of that stuff, especially because it's so, um, you know, the, the monetary loss could possibly be, you know, easier to find. Um, with historical stuff, you know, we try to, you know, play it safe, but, you know, we're not going to pick anything that's going to be, you know, out of control. But, um, yes, yeah, so we look at that, but we're, you know, um, when we consider them, so yeah. Amanda, I see your question of could it be done using BPress's digital commons? Yes, absolutely. If you have a, a discovery layer um, of any kind, it can harvest from BPress. I would actually even add that it would be easier to harvest from BPress than it would be from Preservica. But yeah, the, the missing, any content management system can be used, it, uh, provided you have a discovery layer be it Primo or, or something else, um, Blacklight Instance or anything else. Any other questions? You can ask in chat or you can turn on your mic. Either way is fine. And please feel free to email us um, if you have any additional questions that pop up later. I'm one of those people that the next day I'm like, oh, I should have asked this. So <laughs> maybe you all are too. <laughs> uh, Here's a good question for you, Jennifer. Uh, how did you get the word out to professors and students? And, you know, I do it when I teach classes, because uh, those are the people who are often required to use our materials. So, or, you know, they're more likely to because of the nature of the class or the project uh, papers. So I do heavily promote it there. Um, I will email individual professor or, you know, like the entire history department. I'll email them because a lot of their students will use it. Um, social media, we do put it up on social media, um, especially when we have a new one come out um, that will that will process out. You know, it just seems that we've just been, I mean, our student use is pretty substantial, but it just seems as Elizabeth's stats show that it's just coming up in searches. So, um, so people around the world are going to process the joy, you know, the joy of the World Wide Web, I guess. So. <laughs> And I apologize. I don't have any cat photos I can share. I only have, <laughs> I only have two dogs. I have too many. <laughs> Jennifer's got enough for the both of us. Yeah. <laughs> I think we love all animals. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you so much, Elizabeth and Jennifer. Um, so we're going to have a short little break before our next presentation, which will be at 9.